Good morning, everybody. Howdy, howdy. Oh, there we go. Well, we're getting it. Uh, hi. Jesus is alive. If you'll sing this song with me, it's an old one. We'll do it a cappella, just like we used to. Uh, it goes, turn your eyes upon Jesus. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. And the things of earth. And the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. We'll see it once more. Turn your eyes. So we turn our eyes upon Jesus. We look full in his wonderful face. And the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. Amen. My name is Eli. I was here a few years ago. Um, about, probably about four years ago. And what happened is we were asked to do this wild thing, was to relaunch Chi Alpha at Texas A&M and to start a church. So this is really fun because in our case, this normally doesn't happen. If you think about this church, this church has given so much to Chi Alpha's in the nation for so many years. And so when we were asked to go, our team, we I put together a team and the Lord helped me put together a team and we moved over we volunteered to pastor a church. So we worked for Chi Alpha, and Chi Alpha planted a church. Really fun. So here's what happened. I'll show you a video in just a second so you can get that ready, but don't, don't play it yet. So we started, and we said, Lord, what do you want to have happen at A&M? To which he said, I just want A&M. You're like, oh, that's novel, right? Because the Bible says that if 99 are safe and 1% is lost, then he would leave the 99 for the 1. Is that right? So it's pretty wild because... You keep thinking about, well, how many numbers are you going to be happy with? And at some point, God says, I want 100%. Have you not read my gospel? I want 100%. You just kind of, you kind of settle for 10% or 1%, but God actually wants 100%. He wants the whole world to love him. So we said, okay, well, that's novel. Well, how do we do that? And, and what he told me simply was, was small group. How have I taught you how to reach people? And for, for me, it was small groups. So, okay, Lord, we need 10 healthy small groups this year. If we get 10 great small groups this year, then that 10 will give us um, two, hopefully, that will become small group leaders in leadership training class. We'll do that, and then if we um, we'll send those on short-term missions, some of them on long-term missions, we'll have each one of them give 500 bucks to missions because A&M spent a little over $500 million to remodel Kyle Field. So our school knows how to worship. Uh, we just need to hijack that to worship the king, not just, you know, the, the, the queens. So we moved on, and so we, we just kept asking the Lord for all these things. So here's what we need. We need to reach 100%. There are 16,000 freshmen that live on campus, 12,000 freshmen, some undergrads and others transfer 16,000 people live on campus so how do we do that well you start with a little less than a room full and you do what we're going to talk about today the title is called the inward route you fight for a particular type of disciple and if we can get 10 uh, small groups like that then 10 can give us 20 and so this year we just finished year three we're three and a half years in and you, you all were one of our first supporting churches. You helped us buy a, uh, we put a tent in our backyard so our church could meet in it. I'll tell you that. But those 10 small groups, this year we have 90 student small groups that meet on campus. And, and those 90 have gone out. Remember, we give everyone a 3F job description. You find lost sheep, you fight to bring them into community, and then you feed them. And so those 90, we have another 110 that are signed up right now that in a couple weeks are going to start learning how to become small group leaders for next semester. So next school year, four years in, next school year will be four years in, we'll be starting off with at least 150 students that are leading small groups. And, and it, a lot of it, 
I, I want you to look to your left and your right. You're like, this room helped us do that. We would not have done it without this church. This church has partnered with us in a major way. And one of those funny things that it takes is one, I, I believed all this was going to happen. You, this year I, we knew uh, that the Lord was going to give us you know, somewhere between 100 and 150 small group leaders in training. We just had the faith for it. One of the things I never thought about was how much it cost to meet on campus. So it costs us about two to $3,000 a month to meet on campus, just to meet on campus. These are students that are non-tithers. And so one of the things that Pastor Richard and, and your church has done is you've sponsored one month for us on campus uh, for this coming semester. And we're so, so grateful. I can't say thank you enough. The same thing happened. We basically said, well, if we do this, how do we start a church? And we just honestly didn't know. But a couple of things we know is that you love people, and if you love people and you love God, you'll always be in demand. And so that's just what we did. And so this morning, my wife is preaching for me. We meet in Pebble Creek Country Club. It's a golf course of all places. We started off in my living room, then we moved around to a bunch of living rooms, and then we moved to my back porch. We built a, put a tent up, all Pentecostal style. It was great. Uh, about 45 people would cram in there, and then uh, the neighbors got a little upset, and so we moved to an elementary school for a couple years, moved out of that, and now we're in Pebble Creek, and there's, uh, this morning, there'll be a few hundred people gather that have been won without advertising just by someone who's in love with Jesus and knows how to love people. And a lot of that happened because this church was so faithful to give us time to figure out how to love people. We're so grateful. I want to show you a little video, and the audio is probably, you know, just here it is. It's my family. Hi, we are the Stewarts, and we planted Chi Alpha and Mountain Valley Fellowship. For us, the work starts right here. Each of us has to find a place to meet with Jesus and give us a message to speak to our ministries each day. We bring that message to our team. And our team together brings it out to our community. It's my staff team. Each of us has to figure out a way to take the message that God has given us and speak it to the world around us. And God is using it to transform lives all over College Station. Young and old hearts are finding life in Jesus. And each of these hearts that you see, they weren't brought with advertising. They were brought because a small group leader armed with fellowship with Jesus, a message from him. They opened their mouth and took it out to the world around them. And the best is yet to come. In the darkness. And that's us. Amen. You excited? You grateful? Man, I'm grateful. It, uh, it really, I don't know if you saw that, that when they're doing the, you know, the Aggie War Hymn, that's, that's our Thursday night, our Wednesday night meeting. So we meet Wednesday nights on campus. And that's the room that costs us so much money to meet in right on campus. And we are so, so, so grateful. Uh, this is for free because I only have a few minutes. Because in 20 minutes, more people are coming, and is that, that's how it works. Is this correct? I'll just tell you this. One thing I've learned is that I don't ask for things from the Lord that I'm not willing to pay with my life for. I'll say it again. I don't ask things from the Lord that I'm not willing to pay with my life for. There's a lot of great prayers. Lord, save this city. Wouldn't anybody love to see Denton saved, right? Oh, amen. And then who is ready to have 100 people in their house this week? My wife and I, we, it's about 150 to 185 people every week that come through our house, which means a lot of our week is spent cleaning up from the last group and getting ready for the next one. And what I've just found, here's what i found, is that once God says, he sees in your heart, you ask a prayer, 
that you're willing to do whatever, you're willing to thank him for whatever work he gives you to do, he'll start answering those prayers. Think about that. I've prayed so long. Lord, I want to have a green grass lawn. I'm not used to being, you know, Texas, you know, I'm from Alaska. And so we just didn't have grass. First time I ever played sports on a grass field was when I moved uh, to Colorado to go to school. I was like, this is nice, right? This is great. So I want a lawn, and so the Lord gave me a lawn. And wouldn't you know it, that stupid lawn he, asked, he gave me has to be mowed every week. And, and, I, and I find myself having a prayer that I asked God to give me that I'm mad at him for not, that I have to do maintenance for. And did you know a lot of prayer requests have maintenance? He's going to give you a car. He's going to give you a spouse. He's going to give you a school. He's going to let you in and all this works associated with an answered prayer. And you asked him for it. Amen. All right. That's not what I'm preaching. That's for fun. It's God's great desire that at the end of our lives we be found ready and waiting for him. Ready and waiting for him. Ready not just for rest, but ready for whatever he has for us. Found ready and waiting for him. Do we have any champions? Are there any overcomers at church today? Is there any overcomers here? Any champions? Anybody that likes to face and thrive? We're going to start off in 1 John chapter 5, verse 4 and 5. It says, for whatever is born of God overcomes the world, period. That's like the sign of being a Christian, is a sign of overcoming. And this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Who is he that overcomes the world but he who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? So we find this all out over and over is whoever is overcoming must really believe that Jesus is God. And if someone's not overcoming, there must be a breakdown in belief. Revelations 3.5. He who overcomes shall be clothed in white garments, and I will not blot out his name from the book of life, but I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. Overcome, overcome, overcome. Many of the old churches referred to their people that gathered every Sunday morning as overcomers. Like Paul, we ought to say from our hearts because it's true, we're pressed but not crushed, persecuted, not abandoned, struck down, not destroyed I'm blessed beyond the curse for his promise will endure and someone finished the Daryl Evans songs joy is going to be my strength I'm trading my sorrows anybody remember that song no all right I want to show you um, something that the Lord showed me Matthew 6 22 says the lamp of the body is the eye if therefore your eye is good your whole body will be full of light Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. And does anybody know what that is? That gross looking food up there. It's an oyster. Now, I grew up in Alaska, and across the way from me, the little island next over to me was called Prince of Wales Island. There's a little cove on that island called Kaufman Cove. And some of you have been to fancy restaurants where they serve Kaufman Cove oysters from uh, where I'm from in Alaska. Now, the Bible calls this particular uh, shellfish an unclean animal. And have you ever heard this vernacular? If you read through the Old Testament, a lot of times you'll see, this is clean, this is unclean. Now, clean doesn't mean sinful, and, uh, or uh, sinless, and unclean doesn't mean sinful. When it says clean and unclean, it literally means risky food and non-risky food. Does anybody like bacon? Uh, bacon is on everything these days. Now, one of the things you don't know is, maybe you didn't know, uh, pigs don't sweat. Um, so men have a way of getting rid of toxins. One of the ways we filter things out through our kidneys, we have our waste mechanisms. But one of the ways that we get rid of toxins is we sweat, and, and pigs don't do that. So imagine all that stuff, that, that stuff that tastes so good in bacon. Just imagine where that flavor comes from. <laughs> wow, you're grossed out right now. And so if you live in a culture where you don't have great ways of guaranteeing what kind of food that a pig has eaten, and you go eat a pig that's been in the wild, you're not sure what it's gotten into, and you know that all the toxins have stayed in its fat, therefore to eat pork is actually a risky food. You are actually risking getting sick because you eat it. That's what it means to play around in clean or unclean things. Is these foods are safe, these foods are not. And what's really fascinating about this this is so, so, so wild. You just, this is so wild. 
a cow is a clean animal. Uh, the Bible says it, it chews the cud, which means it has a, a, a rumen, and has a cleft hoof. There's some criteria for what it means to be clean. And so there's real great studies you can do. A cow, the jaw is, is too wide to chew on both sides of its mouth at the same time. So it has this real cool little esophageal muscle, and, and it chews on one side like 10, and then it chews the other one 10, and then it goes back and forth. That's why the, all those things are like that, because it can only chew on one side at a time. And what it, it, it ingresses, it has the lips that gather, and it chews and breaks off, and the esophagus, it sends it down to the rumen, and then the rumen combines it. There's some bacteria in there that start to break down the food. But if, if there's something wrong with it, it can get sent back up to the mouth, and sometimes it can be spit out. And then it gets chewed up some more and gets brought back. And this whole little process happens until the food that it's eating becomes good for the body and broken down to the point where it's going to be good to become part of the flesh. And so then the rumen passes it on to the stomach, the chambered stomach, and some of you know that. But what happens is that that grass gets a a life culture, a probiotic in the uh, rumen, gets added to the food, it breaks it down, turns it into something that's good for the cow. The cow, it becomes part of the beef. The beef is safe. A horse does not have a rumen and does not have a cleft hoof. And what's interesting is a horse will eat sometimes the same grass, but it doesn't have that rumen that has the life in it, the bacteria to help break down its food. So what it does is it (laughs) takes some of its manure. There's a special type of dropping that comes out that has this bacteria in it, and a horse will re-ingest the waste to get the bacteria to help it break down the food. Now, if you think about how a body works, there's a reason it's called waste, right? It has too much concentration of some... It's in your body, so it's not making you sick that it's in your body, but it's got to get out of your body quickly or it'll make you sick. And if it ruptures inside of you, you go septic, you're really bad. So a horse takes this... The manure that has now concentrated potential toxins, if you haven't watched its food source, and re-ingests it back into the, the mouth, it goes back into the stomach, and that higher toxic, toxicity food becomes a part of its meat, which is why when you eat horse meat, it's risky, because it could have more toxins in it than a normal cow. Now, a camel is an interesting one because a camel does have a rumen but does not have a split hoof. And this is really interesting because it has a, it it doesn't have to use the restroom and so it can hold its water for a long time like like urine. And and actually the the meat can fluctuate up and down really crazy temperatures. And we all know that desert temperatures can increase bacterial growth in in, in meat. And therefore, camel meat is really risky to eat, even though if you guarantee how it's raised and you cook it right and you sanitize it right, you can eat it without dying, but it's risky. Does it make sense to everybody? So this is where you begin to see the difference between clean and unclean. And I put the oyster up there because the Bible tells us what kind of fish you can eat and what kind of seafood you can't. So here's an interesting one. If it's got scales on it that are firm, they don't come off easily, If the scales are on it, then the food isn't, it's called clean. It's For those of you that are in science, this is a great, it's a hypertonic, hypotonic question. In other words, when you eat salmon, which I grew up on a salmon fishing boat, lived on a fishing boat three to six months a year growing up. When you eat salmon, it doesn't taste salty, but it lives in salt water. How is that? You ever thought about that? Isn't that a wild thought? How come it doesn't taste like the ocean? I mean, it tastes like seafood, don't get me wrong, but it doesn't taste salty. And it's actually a wonderful, so what happens is that the gills desalinate the water. They take the salt out, and then they flush fresh water into the meat. And wherever the scales are, are like portals for that fresh water, because salt water wants to suck out fresh water. It wants to uh, reach a point of equilibrium where it stabilizes. The inward and outward solution is roughly the same. So it's always pulling the salt water out, but the fish is always putting fresh water in. Therefore, the, the meat is not fruit leather, right? It's not, it's not leathery, and therefore it also tastes clean. But a shark does not have scales. Instead, what it does is it circulates its urine throughout its meat and therefore raises the potential toxicity level of the meat. So when you eat it, it's risky. Now, an oyster is a great example because an oyster, which is why the picture's up there, 
an oyster, you can have 0.001 parts per million mercury uh, in the ocean. And an oyster will see the mercury going by and grab it. An oyster lives in this water that a clean fish lives in. But an oyster grabs the mercury and will take it from 0.001 to 0.01, an order of magnitude more toxic than the water around it, to a toxic amount where if you eat it, you could actually poison yourself, which is why they caution women not to eat it, in particular while they're pregnant. Okay? So here's the wild deal. What's the difference between an unclean and a clean animal? An unclean animal is more toxic than the water that it swims in. And a clean animal is cleaner than the water that it swims in. This is the difference between being a Christian, a real Christian, and a non-Christian. A real Christian, I was in Mary Poppins, the movie, uh, last year. And I was, it was in there, and I was, I'd cut off movies for a while and asked the Lord if I could take my family to this one. And he said yes. And so I'm in the theater, and the Lord speaks to me. I have a baptism of the Holy Spirit. I'm weeping and crying and snot, you know, what everyone calls the ugly cry. I'm doing that. And I leave, and God marked me in that theater. And I know that in that theater, there are people that were not getting closer to God. They were getting further from Him. How can some people on the Internet end up royally tempted and in sin, and others can end up getting closer to God? It has to do with what kind of life is inside of you. And the Bible tells us what that life is that gives you the ability to become cleaner than the world around you. In other words, pressed but not crushed, persecuted, not abandoned, struck down, not destroyed. What does it take to be able to live in a world full of sin and end up more pure than less pure? Well, the Bible says there's a different kind of life inside you. The cow has a different kind of life it combines with its food before it gets passed on to its body. And the Christians have a a Christian, not in name, a Christian Christian like we're going to talk about now from my favorite parable uh, that I'm going to do in seven minutes. Woo-hoo! In uh, Matthew chapter 13 is the first time Jesus spoke publicly in a parable. It's a switch of his ministry. If I had more time, I'd tell you all about it. It's the only parable that's mentioned in three of the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. It's Matthew 13, Mark 4, Luke chapter 8. Whenever God repeats himself three times, pay attention. There's more scripture given in this parable than any other parable. When his disciples come to him and they say, how come you now speak in parables? He tells them why, because they noticed it was different. And then he said, when they asked him what it meant, he goes, you don't understand this parable? If you don't understand this one, how can you understand the rest? So this is the key parable. If you want to understand the prodigal son, you have to understand this one. If you don't understand this one, you don't understand the prodigal son. That's just how it works. Does this make sense? So here is the parable, and you know what it is. I'll paraphrase for time's sake, but I would love you to go study it. Here's, if you want to study it, you can do what I did, where you grab your journal, and you put each Matthew, Mark, and Luke side by side of each one, and compare and, and see what is added, and at some point you'll get to a picture but you remember, Jesus, it says the sower went to sow, and he, some of the seed fell on the, the pathway, some fell on the, the rocky soil, some fell on the thorny soil, and some fell on good soil. Well, they asked the Billy Graham crusade how many people that made decisions at a crusade, how many they expected to stay saved? How many of these decisions do you expect to keep? And they said, well, we, we expect 25%. They said, why? And they said, well, one out of the four soils is good, and three out of the four was bad, and so we just kind of planned for that. Well, Charles Finney, who led half a million people by himself to the Lord, said, I believe that these soils tell you who's ready for the gospel and who's not. And it tells you what has to happen in the heart before they're ready to, to, to get the seed for the seed to survive. And as I looked into this, I was really wrestling with it because I did an altar call and 50 students came to the front, and they bowed, and they cried. And, and 40 of them disappeared into who knows where. And 10 of them were there. And I, I was like, Lord, I should not have any cynicism when I see people coming to the altar to get right with you. I shouldn't have a cynical attitude towards, well, we'll see what happens. I, shouldn't, I actually should believe that something's happening. What's going on? And when he led me to this to show me, I, was, I said, ooh. 
I have been mistaken on many things. And here is the first one I caught. I'll just paraphrase it before I read this. He said this. Some seed fell on the pathway. Luke adds it was trampled down. It says received it without understanding. And the enemy came and it says this took away that which was in his heart. That's what it says. Took away. I always thought putting the seed in your heart, receiving the seed in your heart equaled salvation. But if you look at Jesus' words in Matthew 13, Mark 4, and Luke 8, that seed in the heart gets taken out. So that can't mean saved. Because he says they obviously were not. The second one, which we're going to read right now, is, he explains it. He received seed in the stony places. Uh, we're going to pause, and if you go to the picture. I, drew, I, I made a cool clip art picture for you of stony places. Uh, I'm a graphic, I was not a graphics major, so that's that. Um, but there it is. There is the, um, uh, the, the shallow soil, the rocky soil. And this is interesting. It says the seed that fell is, is uh, immediately sprang up. And when the sun came out, withered because it had no inward root. And so you see the thing, the, the thing that's in the way, the rocks are in the way, and it keeps the root from going down. And the inward root is the difference between a clean and an unclean animal. The inward root is when the Holy Spirit tells you himself you're mine. I have a person come to me and goes, Eli, am I saved? And I normally would say, well, did you pray this? Did you pray this? Did you pray this? And he goes, yeah. I'm like, well, you must be saved. And so I assure him. And I read Romans, and the Bible said, Jesus says in Romans 8, my spirit bears witness. Eli, how come you're assuring people that I've never assured yet? How come you're telling them okay when my Holy Spirit hadn't told them they're okay? I go, okay, I don't do that anymore. <laughs> I, I, I hands off. It's not my job. God keeps the books. I don't. I don't want to have to face him for assuring someone that his Holy Spirit hasn't borne witness to. They have to have an inner root, and the only one that can tell them they have it is the Holy Spirit. So if you're here this morning and you haven't been assured from God on high, then don't ask me. <laughs> ask the Lord and ask him what you got to do to get assured because he's the only one that can give it. So there we are. Here's the shallow soil. The shallow soil, that, that top little couple inches of soil is highly fertile. So fertile that you grow really quick when you're there. It says, it immediately receives it with joy. Why would someone be super excited about becoming part of Eagle Point or Mountain Valley or Chi Alpha? Why would they immediately receive them with joy? Well, one reason I can think of is finally we have community. Man, I'm raising kids. I didn't know what to do. And Wow, great. you got fam, Christian family. Oh, yeah, we can go through life together. They love me. I love them. We like the same football team. This is great. I finally found where I belong in this community. And that's one of the reasons you can be so excited about the gospel is look at what it gives you. And the second reason is because you had such guilt. You know, some guy, he loses his temper on his wife, and, you know, some wife has had this towards her husband, and all of a sudden they can be like come to the cross and find forgiveness and immediately receive the, the message with joy. This is someone who goes from small group to small group, maybe church to church. The, they can't grow where they're planted because... They continue to use the nutrients there, so the roots have to go somewhere else. Instead of getting deeper in God, they go out into other parts of the community. Maybe if I volunteer here, maybe if I volunteer here. And it's always this thing, trying to find out where they can be fed, but there's no inward root that feeds them. Everyone understand what I'm fighting for? So then, he says, when the sun comes out, if you were to describe what the sunshine is before we read it, if you, Jesus, it's, no, it's not scary that the sun comes out. It's pretty normal. Actually, if you want to be a plant and grow, you ought to be able to face the sunshine. Amen? If I have to hide a plant from sunshine, there's something really messed up. Not every plant can take can take the full heat of the day, but at some point the plant should be able to take the full heat of the day. It's what Jesus is saying, if it has an inward root. If I was to say the sunshine that grows us, I would have said it's probably the love of God or grace or something, mercy maybe. But Jesus says rooted and established in love. When he describes what the sunshine is, let's see what he says. These are his words. 
For when tribulation or persecution arises because of the word, immediately he stumbles. Afterward, when tribulation or persecution arises, in a time of temptation, fall away. The sunshine that grows you, the sunshine that Jesus sends to grow his Christians, is persecution, temptation, and tribulation. This is the sunshine that reveals the inward root. This is the great freedom I have. If I have to protect a student on campus from being tempted, oh, what a, what a padded room I create for them. How much effort do I have to do to go through to try to create a safe space where my students don't have to face reality because I know they would fail. So instead, I switched it. I go, they just don't have an inward root. I now know what to pray for. I know what to fight for. And I know what the rocks are. And here's where I'll end as the worship team comes back. The rocks are quite simply this. When most people come to God, they give Him all their bad things. They never think to give Him their good things. My kids are in the bathtub, and True's got a Noah's Ark for Christmas, my youngest boy. So they got the Ark in there, and it's floating. And the flood comes up, and pull the plug, and the flood goes down, and all the animals come off, and they remember that Noah sacrificed a lamb and so they start looking for a lamb but there's only a good, one good lamb he's still pretty good it's a Christmas present like, we don't want to sacrifice that lamb look it's I love this toy uh, so they start going and scrounging find a little uh, stuffed animal it's got an ear ripped off and a leg gone and this And don't you dare call that a sacrifice that's a mercy killing immediately receives it with joy. Oh, God, thank you. This gospel cost me nothing because all it did was give me something right now. Persecution, temptation, tribulation is what God wants to use to grow His people. And it's the, only, it's the great tester if there's any inward root or not. That's the great tester. If you wilt under temptation, it's really simple. No inward root. If you wilt under persecution, it's real simple. There's no inward root. If you will, it's under tribulation when times are hard. It's just so hard, Pastor Eli. You don't know what it's like being a student on campus with all these girls and these guys and everyone. I do know what it's like because I've grown up in the sunshine too. And if you get an inward root in God, when this stuff happens, you'll get closer to Him. You'll end up cleaner than the world around you because you got a new kind of life in you. What does it take for an animal to grow up on the dirt of earth and end up cleaner. It takes a new kind of life in that animal, a Holy, a Holy Spirit life, a Holy Spirit root. By Him we cry, Abba, Father. And so stand with me as I quit talking. I believe this message is for some of you. I believe there's just an admission that has to happen of you know what if you just look at what the sunshine does to me and nothing else then it's obvious I don't have an inward root and there's that you have to get real, real with God you just got to say God that's me I haven't given you my good things and maybe my you know I found we have all sort of things that we would never think about sacrificing one of them is the desire to be a good father wait what well here's what it is let's say God asked you to do something and it happens to coincide with your son's birthday. God, I want to be a good dad. There's no way you would ask me to do something that means I'm not going to appear to be a good dad. Actually, it is. David Wilkerson, he wasn't there for one of his son's birth, which was the same day that Nikki Cruz got saved. And Nikki Cruz has led thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands of people to God. Would we really deny God his right in our life to use us as he wants us? Some people would say, if it means that I'm not going to look like this, then yeah, I would deny him his right. And that's what the rocks are, is unyielded rights. They're great things that we would never think about giving to God because we wouldn't think that he would ever take them from us. And if you want to last, that's what it is. You just got to yield your rights. New Testament's favorite term for a Christian is a bond slave. God takes care of the things like my house and my car and I think about how to take care of his smile 
That's it. If I can make him smile today, my job's well done. And it's his fault to worry about the rest. That's it. That's what a Christian is. We go from picking God into our life for happiness, but to living for his happiness. That's the switch. That's the difference between clean and unclean. So some there's that. There's no inward root, and you just got to confess it. And it won't be done today. It'll take a little while. It could be done today, but it might not be done today. You go, what else is there, Lord, have I not given you? And it just could be a month. And one guy was a year. And others of you, you now know how to explain what it is that when you see people fall away, that's what it was. Is the seed was there, it was growing, but there was no inward root. And the great tester of that all is the sunshine. So don't protect people from sunshine. But keep them from growing in God. Amen. Jesus, we love you. And God, we turn our eyes towards you, Lord. Holy Spirit, we know, Lord, that it's better to grow in your sunshine than to have to be hidden from it, Lord. The light of your face, God, shine upon us, Lord. In your faithfulness, Jesus, you're always revealing and always trying to grow your people and show them what they don't have and what they do have. Not to shame them, but to bring them through, Lord, so that it can be an inward root, a actual loving daily friendship with you, God. So Holy Spirit, we turn the rest of this over to you to do in us as you will as we bring our hearts boldly before the throne of God. In your name we pray.